Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're looking at the hardest things I believe that you can do on guitar and how you can go about doing them. Before we get to it though, this portion of the video is sponsored by Berkeley Online. For more than 20 years, Berkeley Online has been at the forefront of music education, offering the world-renowned curriculum and instruction of Berkeley College of Music at a fraction of the cost. And one of the biggest things Berkeley Online has to offer is their educational experience from the comfort of your own home. You can study from anywhere and make it work with your schedule. They offer more than 220 music courses, 50 professional certificates, 10 bachelor's degrees, five master's degrees, and the best thing is, you don't even need to leave your bedroom to complete them. There are also a number of valuable free resources, including the handbooks on topics like music theory, music production, music for film, TV and games, guitar, bass, music business, electronic music production, and songwriting. These handbooks feature lesson content pulled straight from Berkeley Online's 12-week courses, instructor interviews, and music industry advice from the community. Download your free digital handbook from Berkeley Online to see what it's like to study the world-renowned curriculum of Berkeley. I put links to do so in the description. Thanks to Berkeley Online for sponsoring that part of the video. Now let's get to it. Okay, to kick things off, one of the hardest things to do is play as well in front of an audience as you do when you're home alone by yourself. We aren't even necessarily talking about stage fright here, but the body's response to a high stress or exciting situation isn't the most helpful thing for a fine motor skill like playing guitar. We've all dealt with this, and the best thing I've done to combat this is massively over-prepare. So if I have to play a difficult section, what I'll do is practice it to the point where even when my skills are decreased by that big adrenaline rush, I can still perform it no problem. An example of this is I'll sometimes pre-write solos even if I plan on improvising on stage. This way I have a safety net to fall back on and the thing is, by knowing this, it eliminates that worry that often sets up performance anxiety. The more you put yourself in these high pressure situations, the easier it all gets, so keep putting yourself out there. Keep getting on stage. The more you do so, the more normal it'll feel. And the last thing I'll bring up with this topic is be cautious with the old alcohol intake and hey, I love drinking a few beers during a show, but there's a fine wheelhouse between feeling relaxed and overshooting the mark, which is one of the biggest performance sins. I won't say don't drink on a gig, in my experience, most people do, but just be really aware of how you do it. Moving on, let's now talk about something specifically related to guitar playing. One of the biggest challenges that I dealt with was learning how to improvise a solo that highlights the underlying chords. A lot of us learn to start soloing with what I call a blanket scale approach, which is when you just take a scale, pick notes from it without any real regard of what's happening with the chords underneath. That would sound something like this. <laughs> fine, it gets you in the door, but I find it's a much more mature sound when I'm trying to highlight the chords and use that as a guide for my solo. Something like this. And I'll tell you, this is a huge topic that I spent years working on, and what I would hope is that you can use some of my tips here as a springboard for deeper study. But one of the ways you can start thinking about this is take a simple pattern and then adapt it to fit the chords underneath, something like this. From there, you can start thinking about target notes. So say I'm playing over top of an A7. I might try to shine a musical spotlight on the C sharp, which is a note that's in that chord. And then when the chord changes to a D7, I might really try to focus on the C natural, something like this. Now I'm telling you, this stuff becomes so much easier when you understand the theory behind it. Why does music work the way it does? And how can you apply that information to the notes on your guitar? It's also equally as important to understand how this stuff sounds. You want there to be an instantaneous connection with your inner ear and the sounds that you hear in your head and what comes out of your guitar. You should be able to sing everything you play. <laughs> And many of us are guitar players, not singers, but the point is not to make it sound amazing, but work on that connection. See, when I played that, my voice and my guitar are intertwined. It's the same musical thought that I'm having in my head being expressed through two different sound sources. And when I'm playing over top of chords, I'm gonna naturally react to the harmony that I'm hearing. The other big thing is developing a vocabulary. Chord progressions 
aren't really unique. They can all be broken down into things that countless other musicians have played over top of. Study your favorites, learn what they did note for note, apply your theory and ear training to this new information, let it sink into your musical subconscious, and it's gonna find its way out naturally. Moving on, there's a joke out there that goes like this. What is the hardest thing that you can do on guitar? Answer, make money. And this is a real knee slapper because it's very much true. So uh, let's talk about this from a few different angles. First of all, let's say you're doing the session thing, getting hired by artists for gigs and recordings and stuff. Everyone is gonna give you the same piece of advice. Your network is everything. Being known for being responsible, reliable, and just a general good guy amongst a bunch of other working musicians is gonna lead to paychecks. I have a perfect example of this. I have a friend from college who is playing in a country cover band with another guitarist. Some years go by and this other guitarist has gotten a gig with one of the biggest pop stars in the world. And so um, through that gig, he was offered another gig with one of the biggest country artists in the world. Obviously he couldn't do them both at the same time, but remembering my friend and the great experience they had all those years ago, he recommends my buddy for the gig and Sure enough, my buddy is now playing the biggest venues in the world with one of the biggest country artists. Almost all the guys I know who have these kind of gigs have a very similar story. So there's no guarantee that this is gonna happen, but if you have no network, there's no chance it'll happen. It's everything, build it, but also be aware, it's a fine balance here. You don't wanna be the guy who always comes across like he's hustling and networking. Those people are exhausting, but uh, yeah, it should be natural make sure you're staying cool out there. On another note, a non-traditional money-making venture that I would recommend at least looking into are digital services like Fiverr where people can hire you for whatever service you offer. So when I was launching my YouTube channel, I did a ton of sessions through Fiverr just to help pay the bills. Also weddings, if you can learn a bunch of solo acoustic songs, this is one of the few places where musicians can charge an absolute premium. I was watching this MSNBC video the other day where a wedding guitarist was charging, I think $4,000 to $6,000 per wedding, and uh, yeah, that is serious money. Now let's set aside our session guy and talk about the original artist. Making money can be pretty tough out there. It seems like it's a winner takes all economy where you're either one of the very few getting very rich at the top or one of the many who's making next to nothing at the bottom. But the internet has made it so that there are many more ways to find a middle class here. The biggest thing you're gonna need to do is build an audience. The bigger, obviously, the better, but it also doesn't need to be huge. And the way that you build an audience is you're gonna wanna stand out because there's so many other people trying to do the same thing. How do you stand out? Well, you do something that other people are doing, but you do it better, or you do something that's entirely unique to you. Oftentimes you kind of combine these two things. But as you're building this audience, they're gonna wanna find ways to support you, especially if you offer something that they can connect with and that they find value in. Providing one-on-one -on -one lessons was a huge thing for me for a while. Um, song critiques, ways to get involved with crowdfunding at a personal level. So say for example, you're working on funding your album. One of your Kickstarter levels could be if people pledge at that amount, then uh, their face can be drawn in a crowd that's on your album art or something like that. You'll have to get creative with it, but once you're thinking like this, it is possible to turn a small audience into a full-time job. Next up, there've been a couple times where I've demonstrated what I consider to be the hardest thing that I can do on guitar, which is keep perfect time internally for 16 bars. This is incredibly difficult to do because the natural tendency is to speed up or slow down. It takes a long time to work on this stuff, but it's also very, very valuable. The way I work on timing is actually pretty straightforward. I take my metronome and incorporate it any chance I can. Back when I was in college, I was practicing about five hours every day and the entire time my metronome was on. Some exercises, I would set it to click on the two and the four beat. Sometimes it would just be on the one. Whatever it was, I would try to find different ways to incorporate it, but everything I did, I was doing it with a click. This all ties into feel, which is an incredibly hard thing to master because it's kind of a weird esoteric concept. How do you even qualify what good feel is? It's just music that feels good. I can't explain it further than that. A lot of this is solidifying your timing by playing with a click, but another big thing is playing with a wide variety of musicians in a wide variety of styles. If you're into metal, which I know a lot of you guys are, and all you've ever done is chug away at those riffs, then you've only looked at groove from one angle. By spending some time with ska, funk, Latin grooves, African rhythms, then when you do go back to metal, you'll have such a deeper understanding of feel that it will add a new dimension, whatever you do. All right, the next thing is one of the toughest things I've ever dealt with, and I feel like it's an ongoing battle for creative types, staving off burnout and staying motivated. If you're struggling with this, which 
I mean, who isn't to some degree? But there's a few worthwhile questions asking yourself. What do you enjoy about music? And what are you doing to foster that? What are your goals? And what are you hoping to get from your art in general? If you feel like you aren't moving towards something or you aren't finding inherent joy whenever you pick up your instrument, then you're gonna need to recalibrate the system. Let's talk about goals. Keep your big lofty goals in mind. Those are amazing to have, but you also wanna have a series of smaller stepping stone goals leading into this thing because if you're down here and you've made this much progress, then Looking up here can feel like an impossible mountain to climb, but if each one of these little things is an achievement and gives you a sense of reward, then you're gonna keep moving forward. You also wanna make sure when you're practicing, you can actually do what you're practicing. So say you're trying to learn a really complicated solo. If all you do is just try to play it and fail every time, that's gonna feel like you're running into a brick wall over and over again, and of course, that's gonna to lead to negative thoughts. Take that solo, and instead of trying to learn the whole thing up to speed right off the top, Learn the first riff at three quarters of the speed, one half speed, whatever. But by doing it in these manageable chunks, you're gonna feel so much better about yourself because you can actually accomplish something. It's gonna take time to get through the whole thing, but this is how you do it. And doing it this way, you're actually getting something out of it and you're setting yourself up to succeed and not to fail. I also recommend trying to find an outlet for whatever you're working on I don't know about you, but I can't practice just for the sake of practicing. I need to know that it's going towards something. And it doesn't have to be anything big, just some sort of project you can put your best into. Taking a step back, being proud of what you made and putting it into the world, it can do wonders for motivation. The technology at our fingertips gives us so many more options than we ever had before. Social media channels have no barriers of entry. And we've all got to start from somewhere. I remember when I would post an Instagram video and I'd be quite happy to get 20 people watching it. Another thing that I find helps with my burnout is now and then just taking a step back and going back to whatever it was that made me fall in love with music in the first place. Lately, one of the things I've been doing is learning basically all the songs off Stevie Ray Vaughan's Texas Flood, note for note, which has been rejuvenating and it's brought back some of that joy that I felt when I first discovered this music when I was a kid. And the last thing I'll recommend on this front, when all else fails, just go take a break come back when you feel up to it. Music is supposed to be fun and there's no point in forcing yourself to do it if it's not. And to wrap it up today, the last thing that I wanna discuss is something that is way harder than a lot of people give it credit for, but uh, making something that others care about. Now, first and foremost, you gotta make things that you enjoy. If it's not genuine, people are gonna see through that pretty quick. But for so many of us, we pour our heart and souls into something only for our desired audience to say, yeah, that's nice, but uh, do you know any Oasis songs? Here are some things that I found beneficial in getting others to connect with the music that I make. First of all, it's a lot easier to make music that will resonate with a smaller group than it is to make music that's gonna appeal to the masses. The first time I ever had anyone really enjoy a song that I wrote was when I wrote about an experience a bunch of me and my buddies had. The guys loved this song because they could relate to it and seeing people connect with something that I'd created was a major self-confidence booster. Write from the heart, write what you know, write to the people you know. Find that audience close to home before you go and try to take over the world. Another thing I strongly recommend to musicians of all genres is study the hits. If you wanna reach people, study the music that's reached the most people. There are songwriting techniques that you can take from pop music and apply it across the board. For example, go listen to Def Leppard and Shania Twain and you might be surprised at how many similarities there are between them, which actually shouldn't be that surprising because they had the same producer. But stuff like the instruments cutting out when an important line gets sung, putting a solo bar of drums before the chorus, going to halftime feels for certain sections, these things are used because they hook an audience in and are by no means genre specific. A lot of people like pop music. A lot of people don't, and you don't have to either, but there is an art form in catching and keeping people's attention, and the more that you've studied it, the more you can take these broader techniques and use them to make your music appeal to more people. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Those are the things that I believe to be the hardest things that you can do on guitar, and now you can go about doing them yourself. Thank you all for watching. If you wanna check out another video like this one, you can hit that link up there. You can get some of that brand new Sammy G merch over at shopsamuraiguitarist.com. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and stay tuned for a wide range of music-related content. Until next time, look after yourselves, look after each other, look after the planet. I'm Samurai Guitarist, and I'll see you again soon.